So Scott, let's uh, start the panel around on-demand brands. Let's talk about these uh, dynamic corporations that are adapting and changing depending on consumer needs. Awesome. Thanks, Piers. Thank you to everyone in the audience. And of course, thank you to the speakers. Very excited to have this conversation today. And as Piers mentioned, we're really kind of discussing this idea re related to our upcoming future retail report on what we're calling an on-demand brand. There's a lot of different ways we're thinking about this, but really for me, it's how brands get closer to their consumers, whether that actually means physically closer or finding new ways to create value in their lives. Um, so as we sort of jump into this conversation, I wanna just take a look at kind of the consumer point of view a little bit um, and, and the way shopping is happening today. Um, we're at this sort of point in the culture where 24 seven access um, and immediately sort of availability of everything is driving a lot of um, expectations in the market, both from a business point of view and obviously consumers have these expectations. Um, this has led to a lot of amazing innovation, um, but we're also seeing that these things, faster delivery, um, making sure that there's always in stock availability of items um, is leading to overproduction, impacts on the environment, um, problems with workers, um, et cetera. And so I'd like to just sort of start by talking about what we see as sort of the um, responsible way of thinking about some of these aspects like delivery, assortment, et cetera. Um, and I'll open that up. I don't know if anyone wants to kick us off in, in this context. To, to jump in on that and excited to be here with everybody. You know, I think what's interesting about what you just kind of said to frame the conversation is that we're talking about getting things on demand in real time, close to consumers. And yet right now, if we look at what's kind of going on in the world, we're seeing a lot of supply chains that are right, like fractured and broken and a lot of shortages, right? And key components, bottlenecks at ports from China to California and a lot of higher raw material and shipping costs, which obviously make that kind of on demand challenging. And clearly we're here today because all of us are about building solutions and driving for a future, right? Where these supply chains are more on demand, more local, more digital and innovative and more sustainable. But how do you solve for those challenges to get there? And, you know, I think thinking that through while we have this, um, these challenges going on in the world right now is actually a real opportunity. How do we leverage what all of us are doing and, and build for that future so businesses can not only survive, but, but truly thrive. So excited to see all of those challenges turned into big opportunities going forward. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know if I'll, I'll just bridge a little bit and then I don't know if anyone wants to jump in there, but I think it's interesting. This kind of came up in a, in, in a previous panel, just this idea of, um, you know, the moment that we're at right now with um, the supply chain as it is, and it's sort of causing all of this, um, this moment of, re of reflection. And as we think about the holidays coming up, some of the challenges that that's going to, that that's going to create. So, um, I, I don't know, Helena, you obviously as a, as a small, but growing brand are sort of thinking about production on a very sort of local level. Um, you know, what are, what are your sort of thoughts on, you know, as the brand grows, how do you kind of keep that, um, going, so to speak? For sure. It's, it's something that's been really important to us from the beginning. Um, you know, I came from Silicon Valley where I watched DTC take over every other industry and you have to be mindful of it, you know, knowing that D2C does complicate supply chains. It does create more waste. So for us, um, we really wanted to map a strategy from the beginning. So that means supporting responsible contributors to supply chains like organic farmers instead of conventional producers and sustainable packaging companies that use post-consumer recycled materials. We also, like you said, we make the product ourselves. We wanted to do that from the beginning. We'll keep doing that. And that allows us to be really efficient and not overproduce inventory, which is really rare. 
um, for a CPG company that's growing the way that we are. Um, and we do things like compost all of our leftover materials and we power a production facility with 100% renewable energy, things like that. But one of our one of our real motivators for being successful is actually to prove to our corporate competitors that these things are important to the consumer, like it is good for business um, and focusing on quality and sustainability will actually help you gain market share. Like if that actually is a message that corporations get from this, then I feel really good about what we're doing. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm sure there are obviously advantages to having that sort of intention in place as you're sort of building a business versus, you know, then retrofitting things after the fact, but that doesn't mean it's an impossibility for businesses to do sort of moving forward a certain, certainly when they have, when they have that scale as well. Um, Nick, I'm, I'm curious, the technology behind Fusion is this sort of 3D imaging idea. And I think one of the things that I might be making leaps here, but one of the things that I think this enables is a more robust way, not only for businesses to sell to consumers, but also for consumers to sell to one another. And I wonder if like you see that as, I don't know if that techno the technology is already being used in that capacity, but once we sort of, you know, as we talk about supply chain and things like resale um, as a sort of component of that, if you see as that as being a, um, a, a path forward in terms of how the market kind of shifts in some ways too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think when you talk about the consumer experience today, even with supply chain issues and, and demand for goods, I think, you know, the experience still has to be there. Uh, you know, some consumers will tend to wait a little bit longer than others. I think that's just in the consumer dynamic. But what we do at Fusion is allow for, especially the automotive space, we allow dealers, wholesalers, even customers from, from, from a private buyer standpoint to, to provide an experience of looking at the car as if you were in front of it, whether it's from your living room or your mobile device or from your computer in your office, it allows for that engagement that I think, you know, we all expect today, like we are on social media all day long or, or to constantly receiving those messages. Our AI technology allows us to image vehicles and put them right in your living room. So I think that engagement will continue to progress and it will be a paramount uh, point to how dealers and wholesalers continue to sell vehicles in the future. Philip, so one way we're thinking about this idea of on-demand brand is really this idea of, fi of finding a way to get closer to consumers. And for us, we're thinking about this from the standpoint of proximity, personalization, maybe showing up in customers' lives in different ways. Um, with this as the backdrop, I'm, I'm curious to get your point of view on what you see as the big opportunities for this idea of, of closeness in terms of uh, the, the sort of retail landscape and how brands are engaging with customers. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think we were starting to kind of see signs, you know, kind of pre-pandemic of where things were going within the retail environment. Um, you were starting to see more experiential. Um, and I think that kind of obviously got put on hold uh, over the last you know, year and a half. But also at the same time, I think what happened was is that people were craving community. They, were, they wanted to understand kind of who they were buying things from. You saw this kind of movement towards, I think, um, uh, wanting to help kind of your neighbor, the small businesses. And I think, you know, with, with, while there's still obviously a great demand for being able to get things in a very quick period of time, and there's this notion on that we're still going to see a lot of you know, online and e-commerce will continue to grow. But at the same time, there is this, this notion and idea of understanding like who's making the product, where are they coming from, um, and really building this kind of sense of community because, you know, supply chains are really being constrained, obviously, this holiday season. Um, and at the same time, you're going to see people are probably you know, buying more local, reaching out to their kind of local merchants. And, um, you know, and you see storytelling becoming really big with a lot of uh, retailers um, you're really trying to kind of connect with that kind of more emotional kind of one on one. Yeah, I like the I like the way you're framing it because in that sense, like this idea of community that you're talking about can show up both in a store, obviously, and then in an online context. And it's just really like 
connecting the dots between what people are actually buying and the, the stories behind those things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see that a lot where, you know, it's, it's like you want to understand kind of who the maker, the maker's story, who you're buying from. Um, and I think I was just, I've been impressed by a lot of the innovation that um, small businesses have shown. Also their adoption towards um, new forms of technology, uh, which you just necessarily didn't see kind of in years past. And I think you kind of bring that into all of a sudden now with so many of the, the tools out there, you know, those small businesses can be you know, competitive because there's so many kind of retail tools that are, that are being provided that you know, just didn't exist a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's great. I mean, we're, it's so easy to get sort of always be speaking about the big brands that are kind of doing things in the in the marketplace and forget that there's a lot of innovation coming from that sort of like bottoms up level, you know, in many cases out of necessity. So that's really great. Providing those those tools and technologies to anyone who's selling, I think, is so important to um, increase that level engage, of, of engagement and just kind of change the equation, so to speak. Um, I, I want to turn to you for a moment here, Christian, and, um, you know, again, sort of open ended question here. But, you know, as I mentioned at the start, there's this idea that we're exploring within this within on demand brand that the brands are looking for ways to get closer to customers um, and I proximity, personalization, um, integrating themselves into, into customers lives. Um, as you see that, look at that as the backdrop, um, what do you think are some of the big opportunities for brands to be exploring within this space? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so I, I wanted to, it's kind of interesting. I think the, the question that you started with the supply chain, I think it's a really one of the many examples, COVID and before that, it, it just points to the fact that the fashion industry has been sort of in this uh, death spiral for the past you know couple of decades, right? Where you have sort of, more, faster, cheaper, uh, you know, it's, a, it's killing our planet, right? It's like the second most polluting uh, uh, industry. It's, it's hurting our people, it's eliminating, you know, bringing jobs in different places in the wrong way. It's, you have uh, all kind of uh, uh, child labor is going, you know, like you read that every day, you, you have this, uh, this incredible uh, 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 push to crush designers. I mean, it's like you have this whole move towards independent creators being crushed by, a sort of a handful of, of, of things that get concentrated in this in this uh, sort of manufacturing hubs that promise a bunch of things, uh, but in essence are just driving towards this uh, uh, this uh, consolidation of, of how do I make this uh, faster and cheaper. And also the consumer, as you're rightfully asking, um, are demanding a different uh, kind of experience, right? So from timeline to TikTok, they want to, you know, you are, we are li living in the age of... Uh, of uh, a thousand true fans. I mean, that's that's really all that matters and drives. So, how do you build a brand that can communicate with uh, with those uh, with those true fans in a way that's uh, sustainable and valuable? Um, and and you know, how can, how can you do that when also the consumer is demanding ac ac accountability, right? So you see what's going on in terms of just not sort of greenwashing, but really truly providing provenance and understanding what sustainability means from the fiber all the way to the to, to what I'm wearing or, or, or you're saying. So for us, uh, the way our vision and what we looked at at, at this six years ago is that you can't really fix a broken system. You can take incrementally and just try to get the supply chain to be a little bit better or the design system to be a little bit better or, you know, let's go talk to the pattern makers and maybe they will be more open. Instead, you have to reimagine a new one uh, where maybe the, 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 the key insight is that this, this supply chain has become values chain and, and you have to like look at this from a, from a complete end to end, you know, from the creator's creation to the customer's closet, you know, what does it take to build a sustainable, uh, transparent system that takes advantage of sort of the technologies that, that Nick is talking about whether there's blockchain or AI, but more importantly, it, it, um, it, it takes this sort of legacy way of doing fashion, which is design, make, sell, waste, to something that's, that's designed, sell, make. This, this, this uh, garment I have behind me doesn't need to exist until when and where is needed. And so if you could actually do that, if you can enable a creator to have a meaningful conversation through product with your 1,000 true fans or 10,000 true fans without having the, the, the inventory uh, weight, without being 
uh, hardened by what the manufacturer thinks you can or cannot do without shipping this thing across the world, you know, uh, burning ozone holes in the in the atmosphere. You can actually do well and do good. Um, and and uh, that's the uh, that's the view and the and 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 the purpose we have behind uh, behind what we are building with resonance, empowering these creators to uh, build sustainable and valuable brands by with no inventory, with uh, design, sell, and make. And that's the platform that we're offering them to sell. I love the way that you sort of talk about the value chain and then not thinking of it perhaps even as linear, but as circular, obviously, in many ways. Um, Truly a network, really. It's a network of participants, right? I mean, I think Stephanie was, was, was alluding to that a little bit. And, you know, we've been talking about this. I, I, that's the problem with legacy. You, you can talk about it for many, many years. But what what are you going to do about it? And and uh, we believe very strongly, and and we, as we started that that you have to re reimagine a new system that that takes this and sort of looks at this as a whole full stack problem that that needs to take the digital and analog, puts it together, and and uh, and offers that to the to the creator. A couple I ideas there that I want to dig into. I mean, obviously, you mentioned the uh, sort of manufacturing and supply chain component of it there's there's obviously a, a sourcing component of it that um that i want to explore there and then there's the sort of business model that is supported by some of this as, as well which i think we can get into but maybe stephanie recognizing the that you are very much sort of um immersed within the idea of um, sourcing and and looking at new ways to kind of take what previously would have been wasted and sort of putting that back into um, the the sort of uh, manufacturing process, etc. Maybe you can talk about um, what you see as some of these big issues that are um, sort of right now in the context of how businesses are are operating, and then we can go a little bit deeper after that. Absolutely, and. I think, you know, Christian was just saying it, what does it look like to go from linear to circular and how he's doing it for creators and makers, but what about the biggest brands and retailers in Fortune 500, right? We just were talking about, they have legacy systems and old school way of doing things. And I'm really passionate about how we can leverage technology and existing resources to unlock that for companies from the biggest to the smallest and startups and creators and makers. And you're right, we do that by leveraging what's already out there and democratizing access to dead stock and resources. And what's funny is when I first started looking at this issue of supply chain waste and inefficiency, it's really bad, of course, as we talked about for people and planet, but it's also bad for a business's profit, right? Waste is expensive. It eats up now up to 15% of businesses bottom line and it's growing through COVID. So there is value in economic reasons that I think that people don't always realize for them to adopt solutions that are more sustainable and more circular. You can actually take your waste, your dead stock, whether it's raw materials or finished goods, you can actually sell it through marketplaces like ours, and then take all that money that you make and put it back into doing more good work in your supply chain. You can pay your workers more. You can use more innovative, sustainable materials. You can digitize, right, and optimize parts of your supply chain without your overall CapEx expenditure going up. And I think that's sometimes what gets lost here is how profitable, and Helena was alluding to it too, and how much money can be saved and made by adopting sustainable solutions. I mean, one of our enterprise customers saw three times the conversion rate in their online direct to consumer business just by talking about the good work they were doing. And so I think that starts to frame and think about how we can both leverage existing resources and open it up to the world, but also save and make money and valuable time and resources while doing it. Then it kind of becomes right a win, win, win for everyone. And, and how do you say no to that? And I think we're just at the beginning of unlocking around resale, reuse, recycling, redistribution, really incredible innovations and technologies that will unlock even more value um, for brands and for consumers. Uh, for us, this isn't just about the big brands, although that's a lot of who we work with, but what does it mean to take the good work that that brand is doing and communicate that story to the end consumer, right? We generate that QR code. You can scan it as a consumer at point of purchase and see the impact that you have, the water, the toxins, the carbon emissions and the dollars saved. So really excited about what machine learning and blockchain and these kind of tools can do for brands and consumers going forward. 
I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I was thinking about a million things as you were, as you were sort of going through there. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious to sort of know alongside of this, like, is, is the, is the challenge right now that there's just all of these amazing resources that, that exist um, and this is for everybody, but the, the dots aren't connected properly for businesses to know where to turn. Like, what is the, what are the gaps that kind of, that, that sort of stop, um, us from kind of getting to this, this place? I mean, historically we've seen that this, these were legacy systems, right? That an Excel spreadsheets that some of the biggest companies in the world are managing their supply chains on. And when you got a tier one to a tier 14 supplier, this waste and just lack of information and data just sits there. And then it gets to the size that we've got today. I think we're at over $288 billion of fabric and finished goods sitting in warehouses collecting dust are gonna get burned or sent to landfill because it just piled up, piled up and nobody knew about it. Um, so I think again, unlocking opportunities where we spend a lot of time with our software and tools, how do you find this waste and get it quickly and easily from a warehouse to the web and into buyer's hands because that that's right, the magic and the secret sauce. And then going forward, that unlocks a lot of opportunities. Now that you know about this waste as a business, you know where it sits, where it came from, what it's made of, who it goes to, you can actually most importantly minimize that waste going forward. And right, that's the ultimate goal. Hopefully I write myself out of a marketplace business because we've solved the waste problem, but uh, we got a bit to get there, that's for sure. If I could just add a couple of things, um, you know, I, I I think that's that's true. There's definitely um, and I totally agree. There's, there's there's definitely a need for understanding, you know, the reuse and recycle um, sort of aspect of what they're describing. But I, I mean, um, you know, um, you know, to, to to deal with waste, it's don't have waste in the first place. And so it's not that they didn't never knew about those things accumulating in the warehouses. They obviously knew. Why do we have waste in fashion? Well, you are on a calendar of six months. Uh, you have to lock in your designs three months prior to that. You have to buy a minimum of 100,000 of them or 10,000 or 20,000. And that, that which doesn't sell, you have to figure out a way to do something with it. So what do you do? You discount it and uh, you discount it again. And then maybe you get Stephanie to look at it. And then after that, you burn it. And so 30% of what, we, what, what, what is being made in this industry gets burned so that the brand doesn't get diluted. And so... Um, you can solve that by, by using the old system. Uh, so these dots you are talking about, you, you, you can't just solve, you can't get yourself out of this by having a hybrid car. You have to get to, the, to an electrical car. You have to understand what it means to save this planet by reimagining what it means to drive and what it means to have an experience. It's the same thing here. And so uh, I think we see, uh, the, uh, talking about large brands, we have large brands on the platform. Um, what happens is there is a, there is a move for these large brands to get to customization and personalization. It's not that the brand is trying to, to change, the consumers are demanding it. And so I want to understand how transparent this, this uh, supply chain is that you are using. I, try to, I, I want to customize the thing that I'm looking at. And so it's a, it's a great platform for a large brand to take that signal. And then when it, when it, when it hits properly, communicates properly, connects properly with the, with the consumer, you can then go and do a long run on it. You can do 50,000 of them because you understand your demand. So by, by turning the, this, this model to an on-demand model, no inventory model, you can't be sustainable if you, if you carry inventory. It just doesn't make sense in fashion anyway, because you gotta do something with the thing that you have. And so, and so it sounds weird, but that's, that's what you need to do. You, you need to think about how do you not make that that you don't need to make. And so if you don't print that garment, if you don't cut that garment, if you don't sew that garment, because there's no need for it, you will inherently drive this door, or what we believe very strongly is a new model for creators, small and large, to build businesses that are a lot more profitable. And more importantly, which is the topic of this panel, much more attuned to their consumers. Their conversations with consumers is not like, hey, I have a hundred thousand of things that I would like to talk to you about because I wanted to price them better. It's more about, hey, let's talk about something that I'm introducing as a creator that's talking about the cultural relevant moment right now in the in the country where it's attuned to your, you know, your passion for movies and, and, and books or whatever it may be, right? So you can actually, you can actually drive that conversation to product rather than the inversion. So um, I just wanted to add to that too, to what Stephanie said. 
No, that's great. Thank you. And and I love that idea of, um, you know, there there's sort of this shift that or or thing that's happening where it's there's so much choice in the marketplace, but I mean, that creates a lot of issues. And so if you can sort of get to that, get closer to consumers to understand what actually will resonate with them, that changes things a lot. Um, to kind of step outside of just the, you know, this sort of sustainability issue as, as a backdrop, which is obviously really important. I mean, we are talking about consumers in many ways. And Helena, as I think about house, in many ways, I see it as a as a social brand in the sense that you are obviously creating a product that is intended for people to be social around. But I also feel that um, a lot of the success of your brand early on is has been the relationship that you've had with your um, customers. And so, you know, if if we want to think about the best practices in terms of building community, communicating authentically, engaging with customers. What are some of the things that you've learned during, you know, throughout your career, but then specifically through the context of, of house? Uh, so for us, it was really launching a product that solved a problem that we had ourselves. You know, we were looking for a better way to drink something that wasn't corporate. It didn't make us feel terrible. Um, that generally matched our values as consumers. We just couldn't find it in booze. And that allowed us to come from a really authentic place when creating the product and marketing it. So being able to launch with an authentic story, it really gave us a leg up um, as customers are looking for authenticity and they really do their homework to learn about who they're buying from now. And we also genuinely care about our customers and put a lot of time into getting to know their interests and needs. It's one of the reasons that we chose to go direct to consumer. Um, most people don't realize we're the first direct to consumer company in the liquor space ever, which is crazy to say, but we did it so we could have that direct relationship with a drinker instead of with distributors or retailers. And the dialogue that we can have with our community then informs how we develop our products for them. So. That's um, there's a lot of good reasons for us building the business the way that we did. And as as you think about that sort of scaling, does alongside of the business, does anything need to change, or is it just making sure that that is something that remains um, at the sort of forefront of what it is that you're doing? Yeah, the philosophy kind of carries through as we grow, right? Like a good example is us moving into wholesale as restrictions open and people are going out drinking again, like we wanna be there for our customers wherever they are, whether that's in their home or an industry event or just their neighborhood bar. Um, and because we have data from directed consumer sales and we have this direct line to our customers, we can be really mindful in how we do it. Like we can focus on neighborhoods where we have a high customer concentration. We can find out from our community where they wanna see us. Um, and it makes wholesale much less of a guessing game for us and a more focused move to just meet our community wherever they're drinking. And again, that all goes back to supply chain, right? It's like we make our product, we can make it essentially to order. And it's even more important as we go into wholesale, like we want to make sure that the accounts that we go through are selling through our product and that minimizes waste. It minimizes crush, crush product. Um, it's just, it's better for everybody. Amazing. Yeah. And I'm, I want to return back to this in a, in a minute, but I want to turn, turn back to Nick here. Um, obviously we've, we've talked about the sort of technology that fusion has, has created. And mm -hmm. I think there's the, there's the sort of current use case for, for that technology. And then obviously there's this interesting layer of the imagery and then the AI that you are layering on top of that to be, um, to sort of layer in information on top of um, the the imagery that you're creating, I, I'm I'm curious to know have it feels like it opens the door for me to a lot of um, sort of interesting post purchase use cases, perhaps in terms of um, how that changes the relationship. And I think so much of the issue for brands is that they get to a transaction and they just kind of disappear. Sure. Um, I wonder if you can just kind of talk about what you what you sort of see um, in that in that sort of context. Yeah, so obviously the AI 
imaging that we do now allows for a lot of transparency to exist between wholesalers, dealers, and consumers to, to understand that condition of the vehicle, right? And that's all just buying and selling vehicles. But to your point, when we take a look at other industries, whether it be insurance, collision, repair, other things that are involved with the car, this technology can be applied to all of those to help and improve all of those industries, which to me continues to increase that, that, uh, that um, um, enjoyment of, of your vehicle. It improves that, that relationship between the car buyer, the car seller, your insurance carriers. It, it, it allows that, that second biggest transaction that you make in your life of owning the vehicle a lot more fluid. So our AI technology can be really used to, to improve that transparency across a bunch of different verticals in the automotive space. Yeah, well, it, it sort of opens the door to me to this notion of, and, and this has come up in other conversations that PSFK has had throughout various events, but the sort of end product itself becoming a, or, or remaining a touch point throughout the, the sort of purchase journey, which begins to sort of enable a lot of the things that we've already talked about, but the, you know, there's an opportunity for the brand or whoever the seller to continue that relationship, mm -hmm. open it up to more, more services and, and things of that nature. Um, I, I, and, and obviously continue that sort of resale, um, you know, has, does your does does fusion think about this notion of digital twin is that like a concept that has that has come up in terms of that um the broader applications of this technology absolutely i mean when we think about the automotive industry you know i think stephanie said it best a lot of these big companies have legacy systems well the automotive industry certainly has legacy processes right and i think covid19 took that and threw it completely out the window because it forced dealers that have been around for hundreds of years and oems who've been doing this for 100 years saying okay we need to change the way we position our vehicles, we market these vehicles, we display these vehicles, and even interact with these consumers while for a long time they were forced inside their homes, right? So, you know, as we see AI continue to develop, continue to get better, and we continue to improve, I think digital twins and the way car buying and, and selling has changed in the last 18 months, that will be an expectation going forward, right? So the, the anticipated um, future is that you are sitting in your living room, and I said it before, is, is now you're looking at a vehicle, whether it be new or, or used, and, and you're able to essentially experience that vehicle the way it looks, like you're standing in front of it, the way it sounds, tagging certain uh, special features or, or, or even damages on the vehicle. So there is that absolute increased transparency in the vehicle. So that way, when you finally get to experience the actual physical product, whether it be delivered to your drive where you go and pick it up from the, the dealer or seller, it's exactly, if not better than what you experienced at home. So I think it's absolutely paramount in the automotive industry that this digital twins and the AI based imaging that we are doing uh, continues to, to be locked up. Amazing. And uh, Christian, I want to sort of touch on this because I know within the context of resonance, you've developed a, a digital tagging system as well. And this really kind of brings to life that idea of, um, you know, this history that follows along with, with a particular product. Um, can you talk a, a little bit more about what, what this is and sort of what that um, what that tagging enables when it's put in the context of a garment? For sure. Uh, it's, it's very interesting that you talk about it as a tag. Um, uh, it's not a tag for us, right? It's a, it's a meaningful part of the garment. Um, and so I mean, part of the problem with the tags is that you can scan a tag and get the information, but you have no provenance of any kind. If someone declares that their supply chain is, you know, 10%, you know, collects 10% more sun, and such, such that by 2049, there'll be, you know, uh, better on CO2 emission. That's one thing, but actually tracing down to the fiber from the fiber all the way to the, to the customer and understanding the amount of picoliters that you're using to make the garment, the, the labor that you're using, the, um, um, and, and not, not just as a way for the, for the one garment, as we call it, to, to be, um, uh, to have a, a provenance base, but also for the brand to have a meaningful conversation with their customers. Right, so at the, at the end of the day, um, it's not just about the economic value that you want as a brand to provide, but it's also the social and environmental value. And I think more and more of the type of things that, that we're talking about here is that the consumers are demanding that 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 level of 
of, of conversation with the brands and they are choosing these brands um, uh, more and more uh, uh, for that for that level of transparency and provenance. So the one code, as we call it, what we developed, um, and it's it's basically digitally printed. At the same time, the garment is digitally printed. It's not something you sew afterwards. It's not something that you tag on it. It's not something that you you paste on it. It's a piece, if you like, a part of the garment, and that enables um, us to offer brands a very very uh, important collection of of uh, of powerful uh, value uh, because they can they can talk about province. You have IP protection. You can uh, you can use it for social selling, right? So you can your friends can go into place. They can scan the code. They understand how it was made. They can buy it. And so it's a completely new way for for the brand to to uh, to leverage something that in the past uh, may may have been considered a tag or a label or what they call in the industry a trim. Right, so like you, you, you just have these things in some place in a, in a, in a, in a, in a box somewhere, and then you make a hundred of things, and then you just sew these things in. And I think what we're talking about here is, uh, you know, the sustainability you know, the platform itself, the, 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 the value chain, this new value chain we're talking about, has to be sustainable in, in an inherent way. It's not something you can tag uh, uh, later on on it. Uh, so uh, that's that's what the uh, that's what the one tag, uh, the, the 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 one code uh, provides for, you know, as opposed to a tag that you you put on a garment. It, it reminds me of traditional uh, weavers sort of like weaving their signature into the context of, uh, of a rug. It's really, it's great the way that you talk about it. Well, um, I mean, I, I think that's interesting. At, 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 you know, what, what's fashion without creation? Like that's the soul of, that's the soul of fashion. I mean, you, you, lose, you, you take creation and you, you turn it into a manufacturing Excel spreadsheet that Stephanie is saying uh, of, of numbers. I mean, what's 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 left? There's no creation. So I, I think this is a this is a just one one step, but there are other steps that 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 allows for that brand and their their creators and the, the consumers to connect. I, I'd like to return to that sort of com conversation or the point that came up around business models and. Um, I'll direct this to you, Stephanie and, and Helena. Helena, I know you're sort of, you have a new subscription model that you're using within the context of house. And I know that there's, you know, there's, we've touched on the sort of idea of new business models. So I wonder, um, maybe Stephanie first, what, you know, within the fa fashion industry or beyond, like what are some of the ways that um, these new models that are sort of cropping up in terms of how companies are selling to customers differently today? I've been so excited to see the new models and the new opportunities that have emerged to satisfy that right triple bottom line we've been talking about people, planet, and profit. And one thing I was going to mention, I think is so interesting here, right, is you have so many different industries represented. We have fashion, we have foods, you know, and alcohol and CPG, we've got automotive. What does it look like in these future business models to be able to unlock value and resources and technologies and share them across industries? And I think for me, as we look towards 2042 and beyond and more on demand, finding those cross industry synergies are going to be so powerful. We're already starting to see it with what we do and selling some of the unused textiles into automotive, aviation, computer electronics going forward. Um, but, you know, in terms of your specific question around business, business models, I think, and the biggest companies in the world obviously are supporting it and believing it because they're starting to do it too in these models around reuse, recirculation, recycling, redistribution. And obviously, especially for the bigger companies, they're not doing it just to be nice, right? Or because they, they're also doing it because it makes business economic sense. They see a bottom and a top line that improves because of that connection with their consumer. And we touched a little bit on what it means when you get the goods to the consumer and they read about it and they see at point of purchase the impact they have. But what does it mean to continue that all the way through to end of life and back around again? To tell that customer how to repair that garment when it needs to be repaired, to tell them when it does eventually want to, if they don't want it anymore, how to consign it or redistribute it to someone else, or eventually when it re reaches an end of life, how do you gamify it and give them an incentive and an impact to go recycle it at some center and get points and loyalty credits and tokens for doing that? I think those are all the really interesting interesting touch points with a consumer 
and business models that we're just starting to continue to explore and unlock value in. And as I kind of started saying this beyond just fashion, what does this mean across industries to connect those dots? And so a lot of really cool opportunities and new business models growing coming forward. Excellent. And and Helena, I, I feel I, I probably understated things by by saying subscription, because I feel like what's interesting about the way that you're positioning um, subscription is around this idea of membership. And I wonder if you can just kind of talk a little bit more about that um, as well. Oh, for sure. I mean, we've done just about everything possible differently than the traditional industry. I mean, it's hard to come up with, you know, a list of five things that we did the same. And it's served us well in a lot of ways. Again, we've been able to build a business in accordance to our values and, and also what customers today want. Uh, but it hasn't been easy to do, you know, like even from the production standpoint, we wanted to make it ourselves. It was really important to us and we were good at it, but we had to build a production facility. I have four warehouses in Healdsburg and machinery and equipment. And um, it's, it takes a lot of time and money to set that up. And you can only imagine going out fundraising to build a bunch of warehouses is not easy when VCs would rather just put money into growth. So we've had to pave a lot of paths that were much more difficult um, than if we had just decided to go with a corporate factory or made you know these shortcuts that that are not only easier to set up but also make your margin better in the beginning like it's just a longer road for us um, but it was important to us and so for me i'm really proud of what we've built and we've done i mean we've grown faster than just about any indie brand in alcohol history but i'd love to see vcs having that vision and applying it to other CPG and not encouraging them to, to take shortcuts and outsource to factories and use cheaper ingredients and cheaper packaging and um, you know prioritizing margin and year one of the business. Like there are all of these things that they should be encouraging companies to work towards, but to rush it means that you're gonna take those shortcuts and you're just creating a new generation of industries that look just like the corporations before them. So I think there's a big burden on who's funding these companies to really exercise some patience and have a little bit more vision and guide the new wave of CPG towards making good decisions and giving them the money to do it. Philip, getting a little bit more specific into what model number is doing. Um, obviously there is a business model that's in place that's kind of rethinking the way furniture is sourced and ultimately manufactured. Um, and there's, as part of that, there's this sort of micro manufacturing um, idea that you are sort of an early innovator in the space. Um, and that's happening sort of on demand. When you look at this from the sort of standpoint of consumer business and then environment, what are the sort of big benefits of this, this model that you've adopted? And maybe you can just explain a little bit more what it is that model number does too. Sure. Yeah. I think on its face, you know, model number is, um, you know, we are a furniture, a home furnishings brand. Um, and really the, the premise behind what we're doing was, you know, can you take uh, an industry which has been very tired, same business model, same business practices for, for many years and, and try to, you know, find kind of new and disruptive ways to, to bring products to market. And so through, again, technology, through disruptive, or excuse me, through digital fabrication, and um, you know, other means of manufacturing, like 3D printing, um, you know, we're looking at the environment to say, hey, look, okay, you've got a product that today, um, a lot of it was traditionally manufactured in the United States, but then kind of moved offshore. Um, because it's offshore, even before this year, uh, you, know, you had supply chain, supply chain constraints, like when trying to customize products. So if you, anytime you'd ordered furniture that, that was customized, it would take you you know, maybe four plus months to get something. Now that could be nine plus months. And so what we're saying is, is like one, how do you get products to consumers faster? How do you do it in a way that allows them to customize what they want in a product that fits their home? And then lastly, you know, one, I think you always have to be, it has to be rooted in great design, but at the same time, then also how do you do it in a very kind of environmentally friendly manner? And so what we're doing is we're using um, on our 3D printing side, we're using plant resin and agricultural waste to, to make our um, the products. 
Um, and then we're also looking at more sustainable means to, um, you know, by using, we've talked about uh, localized manufacturing, uh, everything is, is manufactured here in the US. And we're also starting to deploy micro factories. So the idea meaning is that we will start to manufacture goods closer to the end consumer. So you know, if you live, regardless of where you live, I think our long-term goal is to be able to manufacture within about 100 to 150 miles of the end consumer. Wow, that's amazing. That's really interesting because then that's almost like farm to table furniture in, in some instances. Yeah, absolutely. I, I use that reference kind of a lot. I mean, you know, if you think about sustainability, I mean, it, it's a, it's kind of a, an empty word in, in a lot of cases. And what does that really mean? And so you'll hear brands say that, oh, you know, that their, their products are sustainable because of maybe the materials that they're using. Um, they you know, may have some level of certification from a certain group. But the problem is, is if you're still manufacturing your products thousands of miles, or not, tens of thousands of miles in some cases away from the source, it's a not a very sustainable practice, right? I mean, if you think about, you're bringing all the raw materials into a factory somewhere, making those, then putting them on a boat, bringing them into uh, you know, a port, then they have to then be trucked to a distribution center and then from that distribution center to the, uh, to the end user. You know, for us, it's thinking about that and really kind of blowing up that model and saying, no, you should just be bringing the raw materials into your micro factory. Micro factory makes those products and then it's kind of white gloved or you know shipped out you know to the end consumer who who lives you know within that uh, geographic area. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting. I I mean I probably have a lot of dumb answers to to this as I'm thinking about the question here, but I mean what's stopping other industries, other companies from adopting a similar type model? Is it cost? Is it just that it's too hard and outside the box? What what do you see as those big obstacles? Um, yeah, I mean, just like anything, I mean, there's this, you have a lot of minutia that exists, right? Anytime that um, I feel that a lot of times big, um, you know, you, you, have, you have innovative companies who are always forward thinking and figuring out like how they can continue to operate the, the way they are, but at the same time, kind of push their businesses forward. And those are the larger companies that continue to succeed. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, people give Amazon a really hard time. And in some cases, you know, rightfully so, but other times too, if you think about what they've been able to do of take their operations and continue to evolve that. And then you've got more legacy brands out there who just, you know, they, they wait, you know, for, for things to happen. And then, you know, very often they're just very reactionary and it's too late. And so you know, the, the short answer is that there is, really is no reason why a brand can't be thinking about this. And I think that you're gonna see this holiday season, a lot of companies are just gonna get absolutely hammered because they waited too long and they don't have this. And so I think you know, where companies who can figure out how to um, cost-effectively manufacture in the US, you know, bring back you know, certain you know, levels of industry, do it in a way where you know, maybe it's less labor intensive, maybe you're using you know, more um, technology um, or robotics kind of around that and streamlining things in a more digital fashion. They're the ones who I think are gonna have a really bright future. Amazing, yeah, it'll be very interesting to look at the holidays in this season as a sort of test case for a lot of the big challenges that are it's surely just gonna continue uh, moving forward. Um, so Philip, obviously part of this conversation is, you know, looking at what's happening now and trying to think about, um, you know, big shifts in the next 20 or so years. Um, as we think about 2042 and maybe looking through the lens of your business or other things that you're sort of tracking, um, what are the big sort of shifts that you're sort of seeing taking place or ideas that you see um, you know, having resonance um, in 20 years time? Yeah. I, I truly do think, and we just kind of touched on it a little bit, that you will see a fundamental shift where manufacturing comes back to countries in a more localized way. So it's not just about pushing and saying, oh, it's about, you know, made in the USA. It's about figuring out how to manufacture closer to, the, to where your end consumer is. Because as at one time it was very 
if you look at kind of manufacturing, even though we were moving to a more globalized economy, you, you started to see this, this shift that was happening in, especially in the US in the 60s and 70s, where a lot of manufacturing jobs were, were leaving the country and they were going to places where labor was cheaper because labor was the, the number one cost. I think as you start to see that, you know, you can increase labor costs, but if it takes, you know, five less individuals to do uh, a job than it did before, yeah, you can pay higher you know, living wage, get, you know, skilled in employees, because then you can employ technology, you know, other forms of um, uh, technological advances that will help then to kind of mitigate some of the, against those, um, those labor costs. Because what you now are seeing and what's going to be highly um, uh, cost prohibitive for brands is going to be shipping cost. It's going to be reverse logistics of thinking about, you know, when, because people are so accustomed to buying things online, but then they're not just buying one of them. They're buying multiple sizes when it comes to apparel or maybe different colors because they're not necessarily sure because there, there's less you know, physical retail. And so I think you're, you're going to see that what's happening i think physical retail is going to definitely continue to take on the prominence of showrooming of experiential i think i think physical retail the footprint is going to, to drop dramatically so a business maybe that one time was operating in five to ten thousand square feet you might only be operating in you know 1500 square feet um so, but it still is going to have a that presence so i think what's going to then happen is that your know, businesses are going to have to figure out how to kind of mitigate their shipping cost they're going to have to figure out what your new your ways to connect with consumers to build that community. And um, I think really you're going to see this fundamental shift back to more localized um, you know, manufacturing um, and even kind of more you know, hubs uh, where companies are setting up um, experience showrooms and, and connection points uh, with, you know, with their end consumer. Awesome. Well, it's really interesting. I, I think that's a nice place to probably end the conversation because it sort of opens the door to so many things. But um, growth in and of itself is not a bad thing, but it's sort of growing in the in the right and responsible ways and then um, ensuring that the um, that the right processes are in place in order to sort of like keep keep all of these things top of mind in many ways. I, I appreciate you all taking the time and sort of sharing today. And I thought that was a really great conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Stephanie, Helena, Thank Christian. You. I appreciate your time. I think it's a very uh, interesting, varied conversation. So I appreciate all your points of view. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you for having us. us. Thank you so much. We're thrilled to be part of it.